Hey everybody and welcome to the Payments Podium. Today we're going to talk about an exciting topic. Basically it comes down to there's an app for that. And today to be able to have this conversation, I've got a payments legend, one of my heroes on the show, and that is going to be David Peterson. David, would you please introduce yourself to the audience? Hey, Kevin, thanks so much for having me. I'm David Peterson. I'm Chief Innovation Officer of First National Bankers Bank, and I've been involved in banking and payments since 1983. Well, I love that you started off that saying, hey, you've been involved since 1983, because one of the questions we always ask people on the payments podium is, how in the world did you get started in electronic payments? Because this is very, actually only one time. One time somebody said, when I was a kid, I liked playing banker, so I knew I would be doing working in payments. And I liked- dealt the money. They dealt the money on Monopoly. Exactly. And that's what they said. And they liked, you know, playing house and even playing still the banker. And with, instead of having the house set up, they had the bank set up. I was like, that was great. Nobody else has ever said that. My story is not so prosaic. So I started my career as a programmer. I'm trained as a programmer. I got a job at a company called the Kirchman Corporation in Orlando back in 1983. And they wrote software for financial institutions. Kirchman went on to become a part of Metavante, which is part of now FIS. So they were an early precursor to uh, FIS. And so I went to work there just as a programmer. Didn't know anything about banking other than my side of the teller line. And wound up you know, getting involved in writing software and went on to do a number of things for them. So it, it kind of got me into the fintech side of things through that Kirchman foray. And then I just kind of went from another, that company to another company that kind of started a company called Goldleaf Technologies, which a lot of organizations uh, used for a banking software. And that's how I intersected with Kevin Olson because Kevin came on board and was a part of a Goldleaf Technology. So we've known each other for... 20 something years, Kevin. 20, 20 something some years like now. Because that and Goldleaf was how I started in electronic payments. So, you know, it's it's great that you're part of my story in getting started in electronic payments. Now, now to get this conversation started though, we're gonna be talking today about APP fraud, app APP fraud. You know, I just call it app fraud, or there's an app for app that. Fraud. Would you please explain what APP fraud is so that we can, you know, level set for everybody? Yeah, perfect. App APP stands for approved push payment fraud. So the idea is, is in the advent of faster payment systems, think Zelle and then RTP and of course now FedNow, you have a situation where somebody is pushing a credit to a receiver. And so in a situation where somebody goes through the process of using the tools that their financial institution has provided for them, maybe online, maybe through a mobile app, and they say, I'm going to send person X or company X thousand dollars and they go through that process and everything works perfectly the payment system itself all works perfectly but the person on the other end receiving the thousand dollars then doesn't send the products or goods or services and the classic example of this is the dog breeder in virginia i don't know why all the bad dog breeders in virginia but every time i hear this story the bad dog breeder is always in virginia so they say hey i've got this special dog for you it's a thousand bucks but you got to send me an instant payment. So they go to RTP or Zelle or FedNow. They send $1,000 and get no dog or get different dog or get sick dog. Doesn't matter. All of a sudden now the sender of a faster payment is disappointed or uh, potentially has been fraudulently dealt with by that receiver. And so what's happened is, is that there's a group of uh, industry folks, particularly at CFPB and the FTC, is saying, well, wait a second. Uh, geez, that's not right for that person to be defrauded. We think that the bank's responsibility, since they used this payment system, is they should uh, make them whole. And, and that's the essence of app fraud. It's not payment fraud as we would understand it, like an unauthorized debit in ACH or an or a invalid credit card charge. But the payment system worked perfectly, yet the person sending the payment got defrauded. Okay, see, and I love that the example's always with the dog. In fact, I have a video up from a couple of years ago when I got my pug Bolty about how, sadly, my mom got defrauded using one of these payment channels. And, and I've got a friend in the industry, an, an attorney, talks about he has a nephew who got defrauded purchasing a dog too. And, and it's just blowing me away that, you know, maybe we don't call it dog fraud or uh, puppy fraud or something like that. It's APP fraud. However, my point is it's not new. It's something that's actually been around for a little while. In fact, over across the pond in, you know, the UK, they call it APP, but it's authorized push payment fraud. So why is it becoming a big deal now? 
Well, here's the thing. You're right, Kevin. This time immemorial, people have been defrauded in this way. But if you paid in the past with ACH, well, you can do a return. If you paid in the past with a credit card, well, you can actually dispute that charge. If you paid with a check, uh, you can actually reject and return that check. So the big difference here is that the faster payment systems we have, by definition, are final. So I send that $1,000 to the dog breeder and it, say I'm on Zelle and I'm sending it Zelle. And Zelle has done a pretty good job, I think, even admits some people you know, criticizing Zelle. It comes up and it says, hey, you're sending this $1,000. This is like cash. Like you can't get this back. Are you really sure? Yes. Are you really, really sure? I mean, they're really going out of the way to make sure people understand, you better be really sure that you want to send a thousand dollars, you know, to this person. But ultimately, you do, um, and so that—that's the problem. Is is in our payment, faster payment systems, you can request a return. I can say, can I have my money back, please? But there is absolutely no um, part of the rules of any of these systems that gives you any certainty of getting that back. And I don't actually know the statistics on it, but I'm guessing there probably isn't a lot of that return right coming back because at the end of the day, you know, that receiver has a bank on their end and their customer is the receiver. So what, you know, are they going to go in and say, oh, well, David Peterson asked for $1,000 back. So we're debiting your account for $1,000. It's, it's because of the finality. We have instant payments. It's final. And, and then somebody gets defrauded and they're saying, hey, wait a minute, maybe we should make the banks pay us for this. That's that's the crux of the of the issue. Well, OK, I get that, too. And, you know, I also I agree. There's no receiving institution in any payment channel that's going to take a loss they don't have to take. And the way that the rules work in all the payment channels is they don't have to take a loss as long as they follow the rules, did what they were supposed to do. But I'd also argue ACH and checks you're not really getting it back there either. Cause even with ACH, you've got the reversal mechanism, you know, you can also call and request it, but it's still not a guarantee you're going to get it back and checks. Oh, come on. Check fraud is, is one of those things that check usage may be going down, but check fraud continues to go up. How those numbers work out. I don't know. So yeah. really what we're looking at in my opinion is with the APP fraud, it's because of how fast the funds move. And because of the funds availability aspect, especially nights and weekends, you've got to be able to make that money available and how quickly right. it can move and disappear that that's really the problem. And, you know, people sending money to the wrong person, that's not new. It's just the fraudsters are making people use when they trick, when they dupe or they, you know, get them to send the money that they really shouldn't or buy the puppy that doesn't exist. Right. They're making them use these programs like Zelle, RTP or FedNow. So is that really more the case? Yeah, I, just I mean, you're exactly correct. There's no guarantee that you're going to get your money back if you you know challenge a, a stop payment on a check or if you return ACH. But but you have a mechanism to do that. And, and it is possible for you to get your money back that way. Uh, even uh, even if it, it ultimately winds up getting reversed, credit cards, of course, you can dispute the charge and 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 have your uh, have your amount credited. So the issue is the finality, like you said, speed. It's it's the weekend. The boom, the bank's going to authorize this based on whatever parameters they've set for each one of their customers. And and the real key to all of this is two two very important things. Number one is in every situation where there's an unauthorized ACH debit, there's a mechanism, there's a wasud for somebody to say, I did not authorize that and the bad guy is right over there. Um, in the case of uh, in the case of a credit card, somebody just does an unauthorized credit card charge, you dispute it. This is not that. This is not somebody hacking my account. This is not somebody doing corporate account takeover. This is not some telemarketer sending an unauthorized transaction. This is me, eyes wide open, sending a credit, and then unfortunately, the person on the other end doesn't hold up their end of the bargain. So yes, it's bad. Yes, it's sad. But my point simply is, is if any entity, whether it's the federal government or CFPB or you know, in, any, any entity decides, you know what, the banks need to make those people who have been harmed whole, then the end result is a huge dampening effect on the proliferation of faster payments. If all of a sudden banks were responsible to give, oh, you didn't get your dog, so sorry, here's your $1,000, well, then they're going to really clamp down on who gets access to faster payments and under what scenarios it would allow an individual faster payment to go. So, so those are the those are the two 
points that I want to make is, is that if we don't figure out an alternative to address app fraud, other than say, CFPB pushing for app fraud to be added to the Electronic Funds Transfer Act, we then are in at risk of, of seeing a significant negative effect on faster payments in the United States. I would argue that there's no doubt in my mind, Zelle, RTP, FedNow fall under Regulation E. I've done a lot of videos work on that one before. And the other thing is, is you're probably already well aware of the CFPB has an FAQ. I got to say it again. It's an FAQ. It is not a regulation. It's not in Reg E, right. but they have an FAQ where they they make what I call a recommendation of what you know they think financial sure. institutions should do. And in there, again, FAQ, you can find it online on working with uh, instant and faster payments. They say in there that if your customer was tricked, like we're talking about, then the financial institution should make them whole. Yeah, but I, I, think, I think there's one element here is when you go back and look at Reg E, Reg E, has, Reg e is actually not just focused on a customer being tricked, but that the actual initiation of the transaction resulting from the trick is initiated from the tricking party. And that's not the case here. That's the only real difference. That's the only area that I would kind of stand a little bit separate and say, wait a minute, remember here, this is not bad dog breeder sending an unauthorized transaction to David. This is David, eyes wide open, sending, pushing a credit, right? to said dog breeder in Virginia. And I think that's the area where I would disagree uh, about its uh, efficacy or part being part of Reg E. Oh, see, I, I agree it's part of Reg E. I think in EFT it does that. But I, I agree with you 100% that if a person's acting in what we would call good faith, yes, I'm going to do the air quotes on that one, or their intent is that they wanted to send this, they authorize it, they go and they do it themselves, you don't have a claim because you got duped. I mean, it's similar to like we see in uh, credit cards. If you order, you know, the red dress, but the green one comes, sorry. Uh, you know, in ACH, we have that too. It, it's about guaranteeing mm -hmm. the payment, not guaranteeing the delivery of the goods. We never That's have right. seen that before. Why do we suddenly have that appearing now? Now, okay, here's the bigger question. How do we fix it? Because, you yeah. know, we've already seen in faster payments around the globe that this happens. And the thing I'd like to point out is there's some astronomical scary numbers that, you know, you can find if you go do some research. But there's also a lot of numbers as far as really good transactions. In fact, when it comes to Zelle fraud, that is the one that gets all the headlines. It's a small like one or two percent of all payments right. versus check fraud, six percent of all payments. So right. even though it's being made into a big deal, which it is, and it's something I think, like you have said, we need a curb before it gets worse. What do we do to fix it? Yeah. Uh, and and I, I have to just tell you, I had an insight on this in October. So I was out in Vegas at Money 2020 and there was a session there on app fraud. And it was this very nice uh, uh, lady from uh, CFPB and a lady from a bank out in the Pacific uh, Coast. I, I didn't actually know that banker. But I thought, oh, great. Here we go. We got a point counterpoint. You know, the CFPB is going to say why app needs to be, you know, banks make them whole and, and the banker will stick up for it. Unfortunately, that didn't happen. The banker seemed to be in lockstep somehow with this, uh, with this representative of the CFPB. But I'm sitting there listening to them. And then they had some open QA. And this gentleman stands up and he's a banker from the United Kingdom. And he's saying, look, you, you guys are nuts. This, this was a recommendation. Uh, what, what did you call it? I call it a recommendation. It's a recommendation and a regulation. It's where they kind of meet. It's not a real regulation, but the CFPB, when they make a recommendation, it, it's treated it like that. I've got to steal it from you. So this banker says, I, we got this recommendation from the, the government in the UK that, that if, if people were defrauded on a push credit, that we had to refund their money. And then very quickly, like less than a year later, the recommendation became a regulation and boom, it was put into place. And he said, it's just been a disaster because what happens if people know that they can do business with XYZ party and then it doesn't matter if it turns out bad, the bank's just going to make them whole, then what personal responsibility do people have to even vet in any way the people that they're working with on the other end? It's it's a disaster a, a, across almost every uh, channel. But OK, fine. It's bad. What can we do about it? And I, as I'm sitting there, I'm thinking about, well, if I go on to eBay 
or Amazon. And I'm looking and I want to buy something. I want to buy some Christmas decorations, right? And and so now I've got all these different choices. What am I doing? I, am I just picking one willy-nilly? No, I'm looking at those uh, those ratings, right? I'm looking at a bunch of other people who have who have done business with that vendor and they've got a score between, you know, one and five. And I can drop down to the bottom and I can see what people's comments actually were, you know, not just about whether this product meets my, uh, my expectations, but also how they dealt with that vendor. And it's the same with eBay, every, every single person on eBay. Now, I get it. Uh, Amazon and eBay, those are merchants that I'm trying to buy something from. But it does have kind of a correlation in the sense that I'm trying to buy the dog from the dog breeder. And that dog breeder may have already had five, six, eight, 10, 15 uh, complaints against them, right, as not producing the goods and services they were supposed to have. And every entity, Zelle, or early warning, the clearinghouse and the Fed all require their member institutions to report if their customers are reporting that they were defrauded, but they won't share that information with anybody. That, that information is somehow secret. So my customer, right, say I'm ABC Bank, my customer has got their mobile phone, they're going to send uh, $1,000 to the dog breeder. That dog breeder has eight, 10, 20 complaints against them, but my customer doesn't know anything about that. They know nothing. They're thinking that they're dealing with a reputable and boom, they send it off. So my idea simply was, why couldn't some trusted third party uh, keep track of all of the complaints against all receivers across all faster payment, uh, uh, Zelle, RTP, FedNow, whatever else might come along, and then make that information available to the fintech companies just in the same way that we make the OFAC list available for people who are trying to authorize ACH or wires. And now at least I have some information that can be displayed, right? Because, because once I press send, that instantaneous, right? Those two, three seconds, boom, 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 boom. It's done. But I have all the time in the world in most cases before I press send to make an informed decision. So I'm calling my idea informed consent. Can I say this particular merchant, this particular person has been reported as, as not delivering on their goods in, in whatever way, shape or form I can do that. And then if they're interested, they could click and drill down and see other information. Maybe it's just a misunderstanding. I mean, let's face it, Kevin, there's stuff that happens all the time. And somebody says, oh, I don't I don't like what that vendor did. And it's just a misunderstanding. And a lot of times I'll go on eBay and I'll see somebody with a bad comment. And then I'll see that seller with their own comment saying, hey, here's what happened. Right. They you know, so it doesn't bother me that there might be a negative comment. It bothers me that I'm about to make a decision to send somebody money that's final and I don't really know if anyone else previously had a bad experience with them. So, okay, wait, David, I, I just want to make sure I got all of this because when I look at Amazon and I look at eBay, you're right, it is merchants, but a lot of times it's also individuals that are out there doing a lot of this too. And I agree with you too. I do get to see those ratings. I actually, I recently made a purchase of a Lightning, one of 1900 jersey I just had to have because I'm the diehard Lightning fan. And I'm looking at them and one guy's got like an 80%. The other one's at a 98%, you know, and the guy at 80%, he's made five sales. The guy at 98%, he's made a thousand sales. Which one did I go with? I actually paid a little bit more because I felt more confident in that score that you're saying. That's it. You were informed. You you informed yourself. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Okay. But here's a lot a thing too is I'm willing to look at that, but I know a lot of people out there and consumers, and I truly believe consumers get too much protection in the payments industry. I really do. But I, I believe that there needs to be protection at the same time. Are they going to go out there and do that research or is this system that you're talking about that will have these reviews, maybe even have comments where the financial institutions can look at going to be something that appears? So when I go to send my payment and maybe I'm sending it to David Peterson, is it going to tell me 100 percent good guy or is it going to be like, oh, 80 percent yellow warning? He's had some bad things happen. Will I see the comments or do I just get a risk war? No, I think what you see is, is, you know, you see, you go to your phone and you want to send a thousand dollars. You put all that information in. So we haven't engaged FedNow or RTP yet, but it's going out to this database and it comes back and it says five reported uh, 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 
bad receiver. Uh, I'm just calling it suspect bad receiver events. So there's five of those, right? And so now mm-hmm. the person says, ooh, there's five of those. Maybe they just abandon at that point. Maybe they go, oh, I want to see what those five are. And so there'd be a place for them to click and it would take them into the database to see the individual detail on the five uh, on the five events. Now understand there's some entity, could be the CFPB or some other entity that that would be across all of the industry that's maintaining this a database. There has to be a way for some uh, receiver to say, hey, wait, I'm unfairly in there. You know, there, all that stuff has mm-hmm. to happen. But but just assume that this database is in there uh, and it works much better than the OFAC database where there's actually data in there that you can actually know that just because ABC dog breeders yesterday changed their name to DEF dog breeders, you know, their tax identification number or other identifiable information didn't change. So we know that this is still right, the same company. So there's ways to do this and still keep, you know, PII information under control. But you bring up an interesting point that I don't know that I had really thought of before now. Let's say that there's a bank that's enabling David Peterson. My bank is saying, David, you get to do Zelle. You get to do Fed now. But they might put parameters on me. They may say, David, you can only do transactions up to a certain amount per transaction or a total of these many amounts of transactions over a 24 hour period. What if a bank said, hey, look, we're going to look we're going to also pay attention to this. And uh, and if uh, and if and if you're trying to send money to somebody who's got reported bad uh, 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 hits against them, we're going to make you go through and look at those before you press send. So there's a lot of options for how any individual bank might take the information from this database and then render that into their online banking or mobile banking environments. All right, I got another question because we're taking from the idea of what's already there with eBay and Amazon. And can I say too that if you know you know my history, your history, we go back to the check days. And in the check world, there have been these services already that would say known bad check writers, that you could you could access these databases of these are known bad check combinations. These are known bad check writers. You don't right. want to accept checks from them. Isn't this in many ways similar to that? Very, very. And, and this is what's so frustrating is, is that I, you know, I talked to a representative from the Fed and we were talking about this issue. And I said, isn't, isn't it true that the Fed, as a part of every Fed now FI that signs up, requires uh, those sending banks to report any of their customers who mm-hmm. had an experience with a bad receiver? And he said, yeah, we, we're, we're collecting all of that data. And then I confirmed that the clearinghouse and early warning was doing it as well for RTP and, uh, and Zell. I said, OK, so I want access to that database just so I can let my customers know. He said, no, no, we can't. We're not going to do that. We can't do that. And, and so it, it is even more frustrating that the Fed understands that this is actually an issue and they're tracking who are reported bad receivers but won't let the very people who need to know about it, that is my banking customer about to press send on a faster payment to somebody who's already been reported perhaps multiple times as a bad receiver. So what I'm trying to do, Kevin, is there's some legal issues here. You know, we we all do OFAC checking because there's a, a requirement. There's a law that says we have to do OFAC checking. Well, in certain situations, at least, OFAC's required in certain situations. Right. That's right. So do, do we need similar something similar? All I'm trying to do is say, I don't think if they change, regardless of whether you or I think that faster payments are already covered under Reg E, I'm specifically talking about whether app fraud would be enumerated in Reg E that says, oh, you have a bad experience. The bank now has to make you whole, say, 50 bucks. That's what I think we need to avoid. And if we can find a way to put into place a way for uh, individual customers, uh, business income and consumers to get informed consent. We've let you know about these. And if you go ahead and send it, then your rights to be made whole uh, in the same way that you might have been under, you know, a, a, an unauthorized ACH transaction are now negated because we told you up front that this was a, a known bad receiver and you sent money to them anyway. So I think you're right. I think we are giving uh, customers, in some respects, too much coverage, too much um, regulatory, we're going to make you whole, which eliminates them thinking, which eliminates them having common sense, let the buyer beware, all of these time-honored things about how we have to conduct ourselves to know that we're, you know, it, to the best of our ability, doing a good transaction, get thrown out the window because I don't care. I don't, I don't have to check anything. 
And if, I, if it turns out bad, I'll just make the bank, you know, send me a check. So that, that's that's what I'm concerned about. I, I got to bring up just a couple of things because I know my friends that, that happen to work for a couple of the payment networks we mentioned are probably going to be screaming when they hear this going, Professor, you know, these options exist. First of all, I don't know as much about Zelle as what is required in their fraud reporting, but I know in RTP and FedNow, there is a requirement that a receiving institution has to report fraud to the network yep. when it happens. I know, That's for right. example, in the RTP network, they do send out messages. They've got system messages that go out to the whole network when they found that fraud's happening. And they've got participant messages that go to individual participants to say, we know it's coming from you or that it's suspected is coming from you. I also right. know in the FedNow network, they have what's called the negative list. Now, the thing with the negative list is the receiving institution, sending institution, the individual institution has to maintain their own list. They have to put the things they want on there. Uh, you know, the Fed doesn't tell them what to put on there. Uh, yeah. At the moment, from what I understand, other institutions yeah. don't share information to put on there either. It's up yeah. to them what they put on there. Yeah, if it's not if it's not systemic, it's virtually worthless. I mean, let's agree that unless you can compile a list across all of the all of the players, one bank's own individual list isn't going to be very effective. Okay, I agree with that. So what I'm getting to is it possible that what you're suggesting here, which I love this idea, I think it's brilliant. Is it possible that that works in conjunction with the negative list? That maybe there is some party out there, yeah. you know, overseeing what gets right. added to the database, giving people the ability to take away from the database because, you know, hey, that's a different Kevin Olson. That's not me. But then use that aspect of the negative list. Use that aspect of the reporting to be able to notify everybody and not have an individual to where it'd be more effective. Yeah. And, and that's exactly what I'm advocating. A national, I'm not going to call it a negative list. I'm going to call it a national suspect receiver list. I don't know that they're fraudulent. They have been reported as fraudulent. So for the next person who's going to send them money, they need to know that they have been reported. They're suspected fraudulent receivers or suspected uh, receivers, Potential. right? Who who have been uh, who have been reported. And just to go back to your your RTP, uh, yes, they notify uh, the receiving bank, and you know, but but the only and they even notify the sending bank. Who doesn't get notified is the next sender. So you mentioned the participant, right? So they're sending notice, hey, uh, ABC Dog Breeder, you got reported. What they're not doing is telling David Peterson before he sends $1,000 to that dog breeder, hey, they've been reported. So that's that's where I'm saying it, it needs to be something national. It needs to be with a trusted but independent third party. And quite frankly, for my money, I would recommend the CFPB. Now, I get it. They're not in the business of providing services per se, but what is the CFPB founded for? It's the consumer protection, right? Those first two, consumer protection. What would be better for them to do than to maintain this list from all of these different sources of keeping track and then informing consumers prior to them sending a credit to somebody, hey, that's a suspected receiver. And so, you know, uh, it, it, maybe there's other groups that can do it, but it can't be any one bank doing it, not, not going to be useful. Right. It can't be Fiserv or FIS or Jack Henry doing it. That would be better, right? Because there's more banks, but it's certainly not comprehensive. It can't be RTP, FedNow, or, or Early Warning doing it. Because, uh, because, again, until it's comprehensive, just like OFAC. I go back to the SDN list. You can argue that the SDN list is just a bunch of text and it's, it's, it's not a database. And it's, you know, sometimes it can, well... Oftentimes it throws off a lot of, of false positives. False I get yeah. that. We're going to do a better job in designing this one and making it such that in line with every vendor who's offering the way to initiate a, a faster a payment. That means all of those core vendors I just talked about, but also the Q2s and the D3s and the, you know all the independent companies who enable those kinds of payments in some form or fashion would then be able to access this and in whatever way they chose display that information as a part of their user experience and allow people to make an informed consent. All right, David, we are actually running out of time. So I got one last question for you. And that's going to be for everybody who's listening who wants to learn more about what is happening here, maybe read about it, wants to do something to help 
potentially make it happen. What do they do? I mean, do they get in touch with you? How would they get in touch with you? Is there anywhere they can go read more about how this idea is, you know, could come to fruition? Is there, you know, do they call their congressman? Do they call the CFPB? What's the next step for the listeners to be able to learn more and actually do something about this? You know, that's a great idea. If we could just get thousands of people to just call the uh, CFPB and say, hey, what are you guys doing about David Peterson's idea? You know, but don't. Please don't do that. Uh, so bankers-bank.com is our website. And if you go out there and go to blogs and just scroll down a couple, you're going to see an article that I posted just within the last, I don't know, six weeks or so on app fraud. And in that article, there's a link to the actual proposal where I wrote up a very detailed proposal for how I think we should address app fraud, which I've sent to a lot of industry people, including uh, the CFPB. So if you want to actually read the detail of this idea and and so forth, uh, you can get that link there. You can also reach out to me. My email address is dpeterson, D-P-E-T-E-R-S-O-N, at bankers-bank.com. And if you send me uh, an email and you're saying, hey, I was listening to the Payments Professor on the podcast and I want more information, I'd be happy to send you directly a PDF of the of the proposal. And, and again, for those of you that are listening to this and you're going to be at the payments conference in May down in Miami, what I would love to do is figure out how we get a group of interested people. I'm talking to the heads of our payment associations. You know, I'm talking to a lot of industry people. I would love to figure out how we could get together. It's not on, there's no app fraud sessions uh, that I'm aware of on the program, but it seems like we should be able to put our heads together and maybe come up with an industry led initiative to say, let's head off this idea of, of kind of really disabling faster payments for the banks by, by making uh, the, the the true issues of app fraud subject to reimbursement under Reg E and come up with an alternative and flesh out all the other little details and so forth uh, and then create a proposal that we can go to all of those entities, to our congressmen, to uh, you know the CFPB and others and say, hey, here's a grassroots efforts by people in the know in the payment systems that we want you to look at. Well, David, I want to thank you to be, for being here. And I got to say, you know, one of the things I learned from you is, you know, t- putting songs to a lot of this. And right now, for some reason in my head, I'm hearing the Beatles come together right now. Let's end APP. I mean, you know, let, let's see if we can make that happen. Again, thank you for being on. This is a hot topic. I know we're going to probably hear a lot more about it. For all of you out there listening, you heard David gave his email. It's dpeterson at bankers dash bank.com. You can also find him on LinkedIn. If you don't get a hold of him, you can email me, Kevin at paymentsprofessor.com. I'll be glad to share that article with you or get you in contact with him as needed. And if there's a topic or a speaker out there that you would like to have addressed on the payments podium, also email me. Let me know who I should get. Let me know what topics you want to hear. I'll do my best to make sure that that happens. Again, this is a topic we're going to probably hear more about, but for now, class dismissed.